Right, good morning, everyone. And good morning to our students online as well. Let's begin this time with a word of prayer, and then we'll get into our teaching. Let's pray. Father, we want to thank you once again for this opportunity to come together and learn. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you will us, you will teach us, you will guide us, Lord. You will, Lord, minister to us even as we learn together, Lord. We come at this time into your hands. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay. All right. So last class we completed chapter two, uh, and we looked at the gospel of Jesus Christ and the different ways in which we can share the gospel. Remember that these are just guidelines. If you are ministering to somebody, don't tell them, okay, wait, I'll share the gospel with you in four minutes. I'll share the gospel with you in five minutes. Don't have to tell them. Right? It's just guidelines that you and I can use while sharing the gospel. Okay? Just something that you can keep in mind. Okay, so we'll get into chapter three. And chapter three is power and love. Now, when the Lord Jesus ministered, he ministered in these two attributes power and love. Now, when you look at when you talk about power and love, it looks like it looks like opposites, but they both go hand in hand. When the Lord Jesus ministered, He ministered in the power and the authority of the Holy Spirit. Yet He also ministered in love. Now, as believers, you know we may get sometimes worked up. Saying, okay, I want to share the gospel. I want to minister to people. And many a times, I've made the mistake of, you know, sharing the gospel and sometimes getting upset or condemning other religions. And I realized that when the Lord Jesus ministered, he ministered in power, but he also ministered in love. So I'm sure you've heard of this saying, right? There's no point cutting somebody's nose and giving them a rose to smell. There's no point in doing that. So even as we learn to minister and share the gospel with others, we have to learn to walk in power, yet walk in love. So we'll see the example of how the Lord Jesus went about teaching, preaching, and doing all these miracles that he did. He didn't do it just to gain fame. He didn't do all these miracles just so that everyone comes to know him or uh, you know everyone will talk about him. No. He did these miracles because he, he had a heart of compassion and heart of love. And yet, he wanted to show the devil who is the boss. Right. So let's look at the first portion. We minister with power. Right. So let's pick up from these verses. John chapter 14, verse 1 through 13. John chapter 14, 1 through 13. Can anyone please read? We'll read the entire passage so we get an idea of what Jesus is talking about here. John 14, 1 through 13. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. That where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you know, and the way you, and the way you know. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. And how can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. And from now on, you know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it's, it, it is sufficient for us. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long, and yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The words that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own authority. 
but the Father who dwells in me does the works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or else believe me for the sake of the works themselves. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also, and greater works than this he will do because I go, I go to my Father. And whatever you ask in my name, that I will do that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Right, thank you. Right, so chapter 13, we see that Jesus washes his disciples' feet and he also tells them, somebody is going to deny me and I'm going to go to my death. Now the disciples are weary, they are worried, they are fearful. Chapter 14, Jesus comforts the disciples and he says this, I'm just going to pick up a few passages here, right? He's giving the whole thing to Thomas. He's saying, if you have seen me, you have already seen the Father. But he says here, believe me when I say I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Or at least believe in the evidence of the miracles that you see. So what is Jesus saying? There are many people who will come and say, you know, he's not the Messiah or he's teaching something wrong, he's, he's saying, you know, he's starting a new religion, he's starting new ideologies. Okay, you don't believe in me, it's fine. Believe in the miracles. Because the miracles that I did was being done by the power of the Holy Spirit. So it's like saying, is there anyone who walked on water? Is there anyone who cleansed the lepers? Is there anyone who raised a person from the dead? Is there anyone who opened blind eyes? Nobody. So Jesus is saying, when I ministered, I ministered in power. If you don't believe in me, believe in the works that I did. So Jesus is also attributing his, his, his life and his ministry to the power of the Holy Spirit. Right? Remember, there are many examples where, you know, in the book of Luke, Jesus goes into Gennesaret. It's a little town outside of Judea, and he goes there. There's this man who's possessed, who's chained, legs, hands, feet. And he was that way for many years. He would beat himself, scratch himself. The people living there were scared of this person. But Jesus came down. He went to Gennesaret. This demon-possessed man came running and fell at Jesus' feet and said, why have you come to torment us even before our time? Now, you see, the, you see the authority that Jesus is walking in. See the power he's saying. What do you want me to do with you? As a herd of pigs, send us there. We'll go our way. Jesus said, go. Did Jesus you know, stand there and say, okay, in the name of myself, you demons, you who have come to torment this boy. Did he say all of that? Nothing. All he said was one word. What was it? What is the word Jesus said? What is it? What is the word Jesus said to the demons? He said, go. He didn't. Do two days fasting prayer before he said, You go, I'll come back after two days, fast and pray, and then say, Go. He said, Go. The power of the Holy Spirit, the power that Jesus did his ministry with, right? And you and I can learn from this. Jesus walked in this power, this anointing, and he expects us to walk in it too. So he says here in this verse, I tell you the truth, anyone who has faith in me will do what I have been doing and greater works than these they will do because I'm going to the Father. Everyone say, anyone. Is that including you? Anyone who has faith in me. You don't have to repeat that. <laughs> anyone who has faith in me. No, I said you don't have to repeat it. <laughs> right? What I'm saying is, if anyone has faith in me, the same miracles that I did, greater than these, you will do. And Jesus is giving us that power. He's saying, take it. I'm going to give it to you. 
Jesus walked in that power. Picture this. You've got, you've got um, in another place, Jesus has gone for the transfiguration. He's come down. And this father is here. He's praying and he's saying, he's saying, my son is possessed by demons. And he would jump into the fire. He would jump into, he would almost kill him. And he almost lost his life. I brought him to the disciples, but they couldn't do anything about it. What did Jesus say? Bring the boy to me. The moment Jesus was there, he said, be gone. And it was gone. Jesus ministered in power. He didn't rest on his own abilities. He didn't rest on who he is alone, but he rested on the power of the Holy Spirit. Let's read Luke chapter 24, 46 through 49. 24, 46 through 49. This is on the road to Emmaus. Go ahead. Anyone can read it? Go ahead. Finished? Till 49? Okay. So here again, Jesus is saying, you are the, the witnesses of these things. I am going to send you what my father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power. Stay in the city until you have been clothed with power. Again, Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. Beautiful. Let's go. Acts 1 8. We should know this by now. Where's the mic? Just read it on the mic so that those who are online can hear you as well. Go ahead. One Acts 1 8. Hey guys, read it on the mic, no, so that the online students can hear it. Check, check, check. Let's go ahead. Acts 1 8. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witness to me in Jerusalem, and in Judah and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Now, just go back. Let's, let's backtrack, right? Let's go John chapter 20 and verse 21, 22. John 20, 21 and 22. Now, Jesus has been crucified. He has resurrected from the dead. He's coming back and he's meeting his disciples. And this is what he does. John 20, 21 and 22. So Jesus said to them, Peace to you, as the Father has sent me, and also send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. Now, Jesus has resurrected. He's meeting with the disciples and he blew on them and he said, receive the Holy Spirit. And then if you go later on, he says, go and wait for the promise of the Holy Spirit. That's what we read in Acts 1.8. When the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you will receive power to be a witness. Now, think of this. Jesus blew on them the Holy Spirit. They received the Holy Spirit. Then he said, go and wait for the Holy Spirit, the promise of the Holy Spirit, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Why did he say that? The reason is Jesus knew that as 
disciples, as believers, just the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit is not enough. If you and I want to do ministry, if these disciples want to do ministry, want to go about spreading the name of Jesus, they need the baptism of the Holy Spirit. They need the power of the Holy Spirit to do ministry. That's why Acts 1.8, you will receive power to be a witness. Right. Now Jesus knows without the power of the Holy Spirit, we cannot do ministry. Amen? We need it. Many a times, when we look at things that we do, sometimes we try to do things in our own flesh. We will fail. Many times people have asked me, um, how, do you, how are you able to share the gospel with all these people? It's not about me. It's the power of the Holy Spirit that is working in us, that gives us the boldness and the courage to be a witness. Right? Think of this Jesus. He's standing in front of all these Pharisees, and the, you know, he's, he's finished the temptation. He's come out. He goes into the temple. He reads the book of Isaiah. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me and has anointed me. He's read that whole thing, and he closes the scroll, and he says, this prophecy has been fulfilled now in this time. I am the one who the prophet Isaiah is talking about. What does the Bible say? They all caught him. They took him to the cliff to throw him from the cliff. They wanted to kill him there. What did Jesus do? He walked out of there. Nobody stopped him. Think of this other time when Jesus healed the blind man. The blind man goes back to the Pharisees and the Sadducees and says, I was blind, but now I see. Who, who did this to you? One man named Jesus came, he prayed, and now I can see. And the story goes on. They call his parents, they call, they get, call people around there trying to testify against him. He says, no, see, all that I don't know. I was blind, now I see. Whether he's Messiah, whether he's not Messiah, that's not up to me. I was blind, now I see. So they come to Jesus. Jesus. Did he do this? He said, yes, I will do it. I will continue to do this work. There was no place of fear when Jesus did his ministry. Think of this. I'm just going to keep giving you examples, right? Jesus is healing the paralytic. The Pharisees and the scribes and all these Jewish leaders are there. They're saying, who told you to heal somebody on the Sabbath day? It's against the law. What is Jesus' reply? Oh, sorry, shouldn't have done it. Is that what he said? What did he say? What authority? He said, if one of your sheep fall into the, uh, uh, a pit, will you wait till the next day and pick it up? Or will you do it on the same day? They said, we'll, we'll go and save the sheep on the same day. The same. That's what I did. This person who the enemy has bound for so many years, I've he brought healing to this person. So you can't do anything about it. Power, authority. They tried to trap Jesus. Who's should we give taxes? If Jesus said yes, he'll be in trouble. As a Jew, you want to give taxes to the Romans? If he said no, the Romans will say, how can you go against the law? The law is you have to give taxes. Now he's stuck. So give me a coin. Whose face do you see on this? Caesar's. So give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. Give to God what belongs to God. Power. Authority. And you and I as believers, we have been called to walk in this power and authority. Jesus said it. Greater works than these. The same things that I did, you will do. Now don't go to the beach and try walking on water. What you have to do is you need to go back and pray. Spend time in God's presence. Ask God for the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Wait on Him. If you and I do ministry on our own flesh, we will fail. We will really fail. Because we can't go against the enemy on our own flesh. He will easily defeat us. Very easily. 
but you and I will receive power to be a witness when the Holy Spirit comes upon us. Do we need this power? Yes or no? Why do we need this power? To? To spread God's word. Yes, what else? Why do we need this power of the Holy Spirit? To be witnesses, yes, you already mentioned that. What else? What? To do ministry, okay. What else? Why do you need the power? Sorry, wait, let him say, sorry. To pray and fill others, pray and ask God to fill others with the Holy Spirit. Okay, good. What else? To fight the devil. To fight the devil. Thank you. Yes. What else? You said to be? To be connected. Okay. Okay. Very good. All, all correct answers. We need the Holy Spirit. The point is, we all need the Holy Spirit to do ministry. We cannot do ministry on our own flesh. right? We cannot do it. It's not going to work. It may work to a certain level. One year, two years, three years. But if we want to see fruit in the ministry that God has called us to do, we need to go back and ask God. Say, God, anoint me. Fill me with your power. Fill me with your grace. And when we are filled, we'll be able to do what God did, what the Lord Jesus did in his earthly ministry. Right? Acts 5.32. Let's read that. Acts chapter 5 and verse 32. Go ahead. And Acts we five. are his witnesses to these things, and so also is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. Yeah. Now, look at this. There's a reason this verse is here. This is who? This is Peter who's standing there, and he's talking to the people, right? Now, a few months before, Peter was afraid. He denied Jesus. He said, I don't know who's Jesus. I, I've not seen him before. Three times he denied Jesus. Why did he deny Jesus? Have you ever thought of this? He walked with Jesus for three and a half years. He saw the miracles. He saw the transfiguration. He saw Jesus walking on water, bringing healing. He saw all these miracles. But the time came that he said, I don't know Jesus. Why did he say that? You know, at that moment, that fear that came to him, he forgot about everything. Right? The enemy bring, brought fear into his heart. And so he forgot. He said, no, I don't know Jesus. Now, just a couple of months later, the baptism of the Holy Spirit has happened. Now he's standing here. The same Peter, same fisherman. He didn't do two years Bible college. It's only two months, about a, a little more than a month. He's standing there and he's saying, standing in front of all the people, the same people, and he's preaching the gospel. He's saying, the people, you, you tell me, should I listen to you or should I listen to God? So I will continue to do what God has called me to do. Here comes the difference. The Peter here, before the resurrection, was, a, was just walking by, in, by, you know, by what he saw. Right? Okay, Jesus did it, so when I can do it. But here, he's walking by experience. He's walking in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And there's a big difference. Let me tell you something. As you and I go out to preach and minister to people, you will have times when you feel that you cannot do this. There are many times I felt, I can't do this. Especially when we go all across you know, North India and places where we minister to. Sometimes I just feel like giving up. I say, God, it's too much. It's too tiring. It's too, too weary, too weak, not able to pray, not able to spend time in God's presence. We feel that way. But it is our responsibility to go back and say, God, without you, 
we cannot do anything. We cannot do it. Any kind of ministry we cannot do without the power of the Holy Spirit. Right? So many times, you know, uh, in my personal life, I like to spend a lot of time early in the morning. So I wake up early, spend time in reading the word and praying. It's something that I like to do. And over time, it's, it's something that I cannot do without. I realized that if, I, if I'm coming to do ministry and do what I have to do, ministering in the church, wherever I'm going, if I'm doing that ministry, if I do it in my own strength, there's not going to be any fruit out of it. But the more I depend on Jesus, the more I depend on the Holy Spirit, the more I will see the fruit of my labor. I will see lives changed. I will see lives being transformed. That's what Jesus wants. He said, go and make disciples. Touch lives, minister to people. And our own, you know, we, we may speak it, but if the, the anointing of the Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit is there, it begins to touch people's lives. And I've shared many testimonies. Right? So he can do it in our lives, in each of our lives as well. Next, Hebrews chapter 2, verse 3 and 4. Again, wonderful passage. Hebrews 2. Verses 3 and 4. How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord, and was confirmed to us by those who heard him, God also bearing witness, both with signs and wonders, with various miracles and gifts of Holy Spirit, according to his own will. Mm. God, verse 4, God also testified it by signs, wonders, and miracles, and the gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his own will. God testified the work of the Holy Spirit. What is the meaning of testify? Right. Now, if, for example, you're, you know, you're going on Bangalore traffic, and you see an accident happen. Now you know it's the mistake of the person who's driving the car. Right. You can go and stand and testify. No, no. That person who's driving the car was wrong because it was a red light, but he still took a left turn. And so that's why the accident happened. You've seen it. You can testify to it. Jesus is saying, I will testify the work of the Holy Spirit through signs, wonders, and miracles. When you see the work of the Holy Spirit, the power of God in your life, it will be released out of you to bring signs, wonders, and miracles. Jesus did it, right? And he expects us also to do it. He expects us to walk in that kind of faith, to walk in that kind of power, right? So we've established this fact. Jesus walked in power. We can walk in the same power. Now, I always say this. Without sacrifice, we cannot see fruit. Yes. If I want to, you know, many times I speak to young people and they say, I want to become a pastor or I want to become an evangelist. That's wonderful. It's good. God is calling us, giving you these ministries, calling us. But it's also important when you have the calling, but you also know that for that calling, there's a sacrifice. Nowadays, a lot of, a lot of folks that I speak to, they want to do something. They want to become pastor. The first question I ask is, how many hours do you spend in God's presence? 15 minutes. 15 minutes. But God is calling you to be pastor. 15 minutes is not enough. What do you do in 15 minutes? Three verses you'll read. By the time you say good morning to Jesus, it's already time over. 15 minutes is over, prayer. The greater the calling, the greater the sacrifice. You know, I knew that I want to do this. I want to preach. I want to teach. I knew it. I don't know where. I don't know when. I don't know how. But I knew I wanted to do it. So I remember I would say, God, teach me how to pray. I don't know how to pray. I don't know how to understand this word. There's so many things that are involved. But there came a place of sacrifice. If God has to use me, I have to sacrifice things in my life. 
We see this in the life of the disciples as well. When God had to use the disciples, the disciples and, and even in the early church, they had to sacrifice things in their life. Look at all the, you know, Peter and, uh, and the great apostle Paul. They sacrificed things in their life. And then God could use them for the ministry. Think of apostle Paul. Everything was good in his life, right? He didn't have to, you know, he could have just, you know, been a Pharisee or he could have worked as a tent maker and just relaxed. I'm a believer. I'll work and I'll be all fine. But there was a sacrifice. And he said, no, I have to do this. God has called me for this. I have to step out and I have to go out in the power of the Holy Spirit. So for that, I should be willing to sacrifice things in my life. And so that's very important for each one of us. Right? Whatever God is calling, calling each one of us to do, learn to sacrifice. You know, sometimes, you know, in, in this generation, what I see is things are very easy, right? I'm not against it. It's good. We need these things, right? We need online and media and graphics and all that we have. But it should not bring us to a place of comfort where we say, okay, everything's okay. No. We got to be desiring God. We got to press on. You got to say, God, I want you to minister to me. I want you to speak to me. I want you to give me the power that these disciples walked in. To walk in that anointing. And so that will call for sacrifice. There'll be times God will wake you up early in the morning. Two o'clock, three o'clock. I remember as when I was a Bible college student, just like you, I was sitting here many years ago. I think it's about what 13 years ago. Sitting. What is the rule in the Bible college? What time is the wake up time? 5 a.m. prayer? 5.30. Okay. For us it was 5 a.m. So I remember I used to wake up 5 a.m. By the time I do a few prayer points, it's already 6. Then I realized this is not enough. So alarm goes to 4 a.m. So I used to wake up at 4 a.m. Now all the students are happy sleeping. I used to feel, why should I get up? Why should I struggle? The Holy Spirit is saying, you, you, want to be, you want to preach, right? You want to teach. So do it. So I wake up 5, 4 a.m. So by the time I pray and by the time I read some word, it's already 6. It's not enough, God. 3 a.m. 3 a.m. alarm. 3 a.m. Get up. All the way to 6 a.m. Finish that. Then you, you know, get ready, everything, do the work in the hostel, everything. Come sit in Bible college, listen to the classes. Go back home, preach a whole, go back to the hostels, preach a full sermon, right? In front of the mirror, do a whole worship set. Go back to sleep at 10 o'clock, wake up at 3 a.m. No sleep. How many hours did you sleep? That many hours. Sacrifice, it's needed. But the moment you sacrifice, God begins to open doors. Right? I remember when I was in Bible college, I started traveling. With who? With the pastoral team. What was I? Nothing. This is a student. Just like all of us here. Just a student. Nothing. I would go to Ajmer. I'd be in Nagpur. I've been in Kalyan, Odessa, nothing, just go. God began to open doors. Now, sometimes what we do is we say, God, what happened? Nothing's happening. Nothing's happening because there's no sacrifice happening. The more you sacrifice, the more God will begin to use you. So even now, you know, somebody asked me, one of the students, how, I think it was the third years, he asked me, how do you wake up so early? How do you do this? I said, it's a habit. Do something for 30 days continuously becomes a habit. But here's the enemy. The moment you decide to pray, the enemy comes and brings all kinds of problems, all kinds of thoughts. He will do his best to stop you from praying. Yes or no? This morning I woke up, it was 2.45 a.m. 
said, okay, three o'clock, I'll start. Let me lie down for two minutes. I close my eyes, it's 3.10. Oh man, I should pray. I should, I feel very tired. Can I sleep for some more time? Yeah, I can. Nobody's standing and saying, you have to pray. But I realized that if I have to, if God has to use me, there has to be a sacrifice. You get what I'm saying, right? If we have to walk in the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit, it's not going to come just like that. There has to be a sacrifice. There has to be a price that is paid. And once we do that, we will see God working. Remember, you know, I, the reason I'm thinking of all this is because, you know, the 15 minutes, 10 minutes break, those days it was 15 minutes. 15 minutes break, I used to read. 10 minutes sermon, I used to preach to myself. My classmates you say, are you gone mad? Something wrong with you. 15 minutes break, go get some fresh air. I said, no, I can do 10 minutes sermon. There's a reason for all of it. People may not understand you. People may you know, make fun of you. Doesn't matter. What matters is you are desiring more of God. Saying, God, I want you. You take a hold of God, God will begin to work so powerfully in your life. And you will see those changes. Amen? Right, so I want to encourage you. Uh, you know, young boys, young girls, do your sacrifice now. Now don't, when you're 70 years old, don't try to get up at 3 a.m. You cannot. Now is the time. Now is when you can really sacrifice, you know, things for God. Right? Okay. Then we minister with compassion. Everywhere Jesus went, he ministered in love and compassion. Jesus didn't minister just to, just for people to see him and to know him. No, he loved them. He cared for them. You know, when he saw those thousands of people and he said, they have been listening to me all day. Give something to eat. Five loaves of bread and two fish. He broke it. And he, he prayed, he gave thanks to it, and he said, go feed everyone. He had compassion on them. When he saw the sick, when he saw the lame, when he saw people, when he saw Lazarus on the, in the grave, he had compassion. And he wept for Lazarus. Our ministry must be undergirded with love. You see the, you see the balance there? First, we talked about power. Lord, you know, walking in authority. Where even demons will have to flee. But here we are also seeing walking in love. Let's read 2 Corinthians 5, 14 and 15. Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14 and 15. Go ahead. For the love of Christ compels us, because we judge thus, that if one died for all, then all died. And he died for all, that those who live should live no longer for themselves, but him who died for them and rose again. Right. Paul is writing to the Corinthians. In 1 Corinthians 13, Paul gives this full example, right, of love. Now, think of this. The church in Corinthians was a church that was already flowing in the gifts of the Spirit. They, were, they had the prophecy, word of knowledge, all the gifts. Healing, deliverance, everything is happening in the church. But Paul is writing and saying, see, you may have all these gifts. But if you do not have love, you're just an empty noise. Have you taken two vessels and banged it together? Go home and try it. You'll not get any tune. You can't sing with that. Even if you sing with two empty vessels, it's not going to make any, it's not going to be any melodious tune. Paul is saying here, you may have all these gifts and talents and the gifts of the Holy Spirit, working of miracles, but if you do not have love, it is empty. It is of no use. It is zero. Under. That's what it is. So that means what? If you and I are doing ministry, and we're doing ministry for all the other people to watch us and to think, okay, you know, I'm the greatest. Yeah, people may come and say, Pastor, very nice message. But in God's eyes, it is a big zero. Now, is it any use? No use. Paul is saying here. Let's read 1 Corinthians 13. Okay. 
I'm just going to read a couple of verses, right? Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. Verse 4, right? It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. Love does not envy. Love does not boast. Love is not proud. It says here, it is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered and it keeps record, no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. Right, so we go down, all the way down. Go to verse 13. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is? Now Paul is writing it to a church that is walking in a great level of faith. If, if you have to walk in the gifts of the Spirit, you should have a great level of faith. But he's saying, we have all of this. If you do not have love, it's nothing. Jesus ministered out of love. That's what he said No, in John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. It was not by force. Oh, the Father said, no, now I have to go to the cross. I have to die on the cross. And then after dying on the cross, I have to rise again from the dead. So many things to do. No, that was not his attitude. He was willing and ready to go on the cross because of his love for us. But even on the cross, he says, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. So very important. If I am ministering to somebody, whether he's a believer, whether he's an unbeliever, if I don't love them with a godly love, there's no value in it. Anything of it? Because he says here, you can do great, you can know many mysteries, you can do great miracles, but if you have no love, it's an empty sound. It holds no value to me. So, our ministry. Now, when I say love each other, doesn't mean we agree with everything with each other. There will be times we don't agree. There'll be times when, especially in ministry, you know, when you work in ministry, there are times we, we may have different ideas, different plans, different strategies. You may like certain things, you may dislike certain things. All of that is there. But our priority and our, 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 the key to our ministry is love. We need to learn to love each other. We need to learn to care for each other. You know, many times I've shared all the good things that happen in ministry, but there are many, many, many things that happen, you know, while sharing the gospel that have really got me so angry and so upset. There's one time I was near the colleges and I gave this person a track. I said, I just want to talk to you about Jesus. And he got so upset, he held me and he wanted to beat me up. I, uh, he, he was so upset. And I got upset as well. Like as an instant reaction, I also got upset. But then after that, you know, this whole thing just, uh, everything just stopped and he went his way. But then I realized to myself, the Holy Spirit ministered to me and said, Paul, why are you doing this? Why are you sharing the gospel? Because I want people to know Christ. But you're doing it in a way that, you know, that is offensive to others. Right? You got upset. You're getting angry because people are persecuting you. But my word says, bless those who persecute you. Now, I thought to myself, it's a nice verse. It's nice to say it. But to really believe it and walk in it, very difficult. I can use it in many sermons. I've been preaching for more than 15 years now. I've used it in many sermons. But when, you, when it happens really to you, that's a different story altogether. So the Lord teaches us through our journeys to walk in love. Have you ever thought of this? Remember Billy Graham, oh, sorry, not Billy Graham, uh, Graham Stains, and the children were, you know, mercilessly burnt in that Jeep. Remember what Gladys Stains comes and says? The wife, everyone know that? Yes or no? No? Okay, so in Odisha, there were evangelists in the early 1990s, I think, yeah, 1990s, where they came uh, 
uh, Graham Staines and Gladys Staines and three children. They came to Kandamal. They were doing ministry there. And uh, as they were doing ministry there, you know, uh, the father and the two children were in the Jeep sleeping. And they came and they burned the Jeep. And as the children were trying to come out, he pushed them back. And all three of them died, burnt alive. And Gladys Staines, his wife, stands and says, I forgive those who killed my husband and two children. Because God told me to love them. Do you think that's possible in our own flesh? Possible. Impossible. If somebody says something to us, only we get upset. Forget about killing. No, he called me. Uh, he told her, I don't know how to preach, so I'm not talking to him. He said, I don't know how to lead worship, so he only doesn't know. He's telling me. Right? We get upset, right? But here, God is teaching us. The Holy Spirit teaches us to learn to love one another. And when we learn to love, that's where you will see ministry bring fruitful. First Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1 through 8. And we close with this. First Thessalonians chapter 2, 1 through for 8. You, for you yourselves know, brethren, that our coming to you was not in vain, but even after we had suffered before and were spitefully treated at Philippi, as you know, we were bold in our God to speak to you the gospel of God in much conflict, for our extortion did not come from, from error or uncleanliness, nor was it in deceit. But as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, even so we speak not as pleasing men, but God who tests our hearts. For neither at any time did we use flattering words, as you know, nor a clock of covetousness, God is witness, nor did we seek glory from men, either from you or from others, when we might have made demands as apostles of Christ. But we were gentle among you, just as a nursing mother cherishes her own children, so affectionately longing for you, we were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but our, but also our lives because you had become dear to us. Yes. So here Paul is writing to the Thessalonian church. Now he's writing and he's saying, this is my ministry. And I didn't come to you asking you for things. I didn't come to you demanding things or I didn't come to you with authority and in power, but I came to you in love. I came to you as a meek person. And the ministry that we do is out of love. And so he's writing to the church here and he's saying, so uh, we are not looking for praise from men, not from you or anyone else, but we're looking to do things to please God's heart. When you and I do ministry in the power of God, and in the love of God, we're not pleasing men, but we are pleasing God. And this should be our desire. Amen? Amen? So I want to encourage each one of you, even as we close, to remember these things. The Lord may minister. The Holy Spirit may give you some ideas or things that he may want you to do in your life. He may want you to start something. He may want you to you know, give you some plans on how to grow in the things of God, grow in power, grow in love. If he's giving you those thoughts and plans, make a note of it and, you know, try to apply it in your life. And I'm sure he's going to bless you and use you greatly for his kingdom. Amen? Amen. All right, let's just close in prayer. Father, we thank you for this time uh, you've given us, Lord. We thank you for teaching us, Lord, just the way you did ministry in power and love. Pray, God, that you will enable each one of us, oh God, whatever you have called us to do, Lord, to walk in love, to walk in authority, to walk in power. We thank you for your Holy Spirit that empowers us, that strengthens us, oh God. Lord, we speak over each and every student here and online as well. Even as they've heard the word of God, I pray that you will speak and minister and, and Lord, reveal your plans, your purposes for each of their lives, oh God. We commit the rest of the afternoon into your hands. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. God bless you. I'll see you next week.